Okay, so the bar and bar, bar and bat mitzvah. We know that the bar mitzvah uh, boys is at the age of thirteen. Yeah. The girls are a year early at the age of twelve. Why is that so? Because we are girls more are mature. mature. Girls are more mature, right? They were they're, they're right, and then even physically, girls mature. Girls reach puberty, uh, which coincides with bar mitzvah uh, at, earlier than than boys do. Mm-hmm. Now. Um, we view bar mitzvah as, most importantly, it's the idea of accepting responsibility of mitzvot. Right? What does that mean? That means that before someone is bar, bar bat mitzvah, they have no responsibility. They're, they're kids, right? Now they hit puberty, right? They become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Now they have responsibilities. And how many mitzvahs do they now have? 613. Every single one that applies to an adult who's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 150 years old, mature, develop, is given to a 13-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl. I want to tell you just um, <coughs> as a side note, <clears throat> what about someone who's actually 12, 11, 10, 9, 8? Do they have to do mitzvahs or not? They have to do mitzvahs, but they don't have yeah. to do all of them. Well, they, they do them. I don't have to wear tali. Well, they don't have to, but you kind of training. It. So that's so that's an important point. The idea of chinuch. We'll get to that a little bit when we talk about parenting. Uh, but I, actually, there's actually a discussion um, in the uh, Talmudic commentaries as to whether or not, when let's say a child, an eight-year-old child, does an avera, does a sin, is it a sin or is it not a sin? What does that mean? What what, what would be the two sides of the coin? Do we say? I'm calling you. Do we say that the Torah only spoke to adults? The Torah didn't speak to a child. If a child does something that's against the Torah, a child's eating non-kosher, so a child desecrates the Shabbat, or a child does, it's not, it wasn't given to the child. The Torah spoke to adults, not to children. That's one perspective. Another perspective is, no, the Torah spoke to everyone. Childs and adults alike. It's just, we don't enforce the Torah laws until children reach the age of 12 and 13, respectively, for a boy and a girl. That means that when a child, do- child does something wrong, something bad happens. Right? It's a bad thing. There's negative energy, right? It, it creates a spiritual entity, which is an, which, which what happens when someone does something wrong. Same as, right? And you have to try to prevent a child, just like you have to try to, try to prevent an adult. The difference is that we don't actually enforce it because the child is not yet of age. Yes, sir. You can't call your little son books and boy and have him carry for you. Absolutely place. not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's a good point. It means you cannot have... What? <laughs> Some people, I say, oh, oh, the light turned off, right, on Shabbat. You know, I'll on Shabbat. So let's get the kid to do it. Oh, well, how can you have the kid to do it? It's no different from the kid, the kid and you. Absolutely not. Well, I actually once asked uh, one, uh, a big halachic authority in Israel about this. He's very funny, also a very funny guy. Uh, ask something about a child, small child, Shabbos, are they allowed to do this, allowed to do that? He says, tell me, is, uh, is the child Jewish? <laughs> he's making a joke, but yeah, he's saying that the child's Jewish. Your child has restrictions like everyone else has restrictions. Same thing, it's just the enforcement is different. Either way, there is a degree of uh, ascension towards being viewed as an adult, right? When a child at 12 and 13, they have the same responsibilities that, 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 that or y'all and I have as well. And uh, another point uh, that coincides with that is is the idea of the teenagehood, right? Mm-hmm. Right. There's the, children when they go through the adolescence, they go through rebellion, right? They go through coming of age, right? They go their body and their and their and their emotions go through crazy hormonal shifts, right? And in Judaism, we say that a yetzer tov, the Good inclination only starts at bar mitzvah, bar and bat mitzvah. Small children do not have a good inclination, a yetzer tov, right? Only once you hit bar mitzvah, only once you hit puberty, once you start adolescence, only then do you have a yetzer tov. Now, this would seem to be illogical. Why would it, why would it seem to be illogical? You see, a small child, all a child wants to do is to make you happy. That's it. And then, and then they reach teenagehood, and all they want to do is spite you, mm-hmm. and reject you, and repudiate you, right? And rebel. Mm-hmm. 
It seems to be counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. I'll cut to you. I'll cut to you in a second. What you see actually happening? That what? You just said. I'm just saying, but if a yetzer tov, yetzer tov is the good inclination, mm-hmm. right? If that kicks in when you're barred by mitzvah, mm-hmm. you would think that the opposite would be true. People become start becoming good, right? right? Yeah. So this this sheds light. I'll cut to you in a second, Rich. This sheds light on the on what the yetzer tov really is. And the age of Tov, what we say, is the ability to make choices. The ability to act against instinct. The ability to do things that will get you negative attention. A child, does, uh, a child who seeks to impress is not really doing it based upon a decision that they made to do good. That's not what it is. They want the approval. They want the lollipops. They want the appreciation. They, they want the love of their parents. That's why, on, based upon instinct, children behave well. A child becomes an adult, right? A child becomes bar mitzvah. A child hits puberty and hits adolescence. What happens? They get a yetzer tov. What does the yetzer tov enable them to do? To make choices. To go against their instinct. To forego good things. To rebel. That's all a product of us as individuals reaching a stage in our life, reaching... Uh, or we, what we could call reaching life and the ability to make choices and the ability to do things specifically that will get you negative attention. Specifically that you're unable to do once you become bar and bat mitzvah. So we have the idea of, well, the basic idea is now that you're responsible, you're, you're, you're responsible, right? Now, you, now, now you're bar mitzvah, you're responsible to do all the mitzvahs like anyone else. Uh, that's idea number one. Idea number two is the idea of the as adolescence, right? The idea of getting a yetzer tov Getting the ability to reject, to rebel, to you know, to become great or bad. Either way, that's a, that, that's an opportunity afforded to people when they reach that age, and um, and this starts as we know, as we're familiar with, you know, this kicks off, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifty tumultuous years um, out of teenagehood, <laughs> and that is, uh, yeah, and that is a per- you know, coming of age is it's a person dealing with identity challenges. And dealing with because they they th- their little body right beca- becomes a battlefield right. You have the emotional and chemical reactions of the hormones, uh, but you also have now the etzatov, and the etzatov creates somewhat of a of a of a whirlwind. Not the right that's the right word, or a, a firestorm within it within within young children, and it takes a while for that for them to get acclimated to that new situation. And that, and that and that is the beginning of adulthood. The beginning of adulthood. Is adulthood means the struggle, and the daily struggle, and the challenges, one way or the other. That is that describes what our life is. That starts at bar and bat mitzvah. What's the next stage in the uh, cycle of life? Marriage. marriage. Yes. Or courting. Courting. Oh, so courting. dating? Can, can oh, gosh. Yes. Jewish dating. Jewish yes. Very, very, very quickly. Very I try to, uh, it's not very complicated. It's very simple. Uh, and it's like this. Dating. Uh, the, well, this is not... Uh, this is Jewish dating. But Jewish dating, what we call... Um, I have a whole... I have my theories and I have theories and everything, but... My theory is like this. There's a few things that have to be... Jewish dating means dating to get married. Yeah. And therefore, we view dating as a, as, a, as, a, as a time to discover whether or not the person is compatible to get married to. We don't view dating as a relationship. Rather, is a time to determine if a relationship is possible. That, in a crutch, is Jewish dating. Right? Dating for marriage... Not dating, and therefore, if you want to date someone to marry them, you want to discover if this is the right person to marry or not. Right? It's a much more cerebral process. It's discovering is this person someone I want to spend the rest of my life with. Right? And therefore, we don't view dating as relationship building, rather as discovering if a relationship is possible. That, in uh, that that in a nutshell, is uh, is is Jewish dating. That's it. That simplifies everything. Right, dating for marriage, character discovery is marriage and is a relationship possible. You do, you can decide intellectually, but you don't know until you try whether it's possible to build a relationship with this person. Okay, so you start you start the formation of the relationship. It's it's the beginning. It's it's the it's the planting of the seeds of the relationship. 
you don't get married until you actually determine that. Uh, you're no, 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 yeah. no. We don't. We <laughs> and you know what? What's what's the proof against what you're saying? People date for six years and get married, and, and then they and then they get divorced. That's so right. don't don't think that experience experience. Oh, but I didn't say that. Okay, so the point is, is that the point is, is that it's not building a relationship. Or so it, you don't it do anything effect. whatsoever toward building relationships. No, you know, All you do is decide intellectually and then no, you get married and then you find out that you can't build a relationship. Why not? Why, why would you find that out? If it's a time for character to discover, you should find out that a relationship is possible. Right? That's what we said. Dating is a time to find out if a relationship is possible. You said you only decide intellectually and you don't do no. anything to see whether you really can. No. You don't have any kind of relationship whatsoever. You merely have a you have, you have, relationship. You have the starting points. Right? You have the starting points. You have the, the roots, the seeds of the relationship. So it's kissing against the rules? And well, I'm against. saying in Jewish law, um, in talk. Jewish law, yes, there's a prohibition against men and women touching, men and women who are not married to each other, touching in, a effect, in, a, in, a, you know, in an affectionate way. But before you even meet that person, you... You know of that person, that's, that's and right. that person knows right. of you. But and if you is, agree to meet, then you meet. Oh, well, you don't even meet. Right, because but that's remember in the prism of Jewish dating, it's j- dating for marriage. It's yes. dating for relationship. Right. It's discovery is a relationship possible. That's why if that's your focus, you're gonna try to get rid of all the candidates that are not. Uh, that are not likely or liable to bring you towards your your, your stated goal. Um, you can have some physical attraction to somebody. Absolutely, because if you're not physically attracted, so you're not compatible. <laughs> what if you can never laugh together? You so you're not compatible. You don't have chemistry. Any, I mean, any that's, funny remark. that's very good. So you're not compatible because you have no chemistry. That's a great point. That's exactly what you're supposed to find out when you're dating. Are you compatible? Do you have chemistry? Are you attracted to the person? Right? If there's no physical attraction, Those are all if there's no chemistry, all into building relationships. Exactly, and that's and that's why we and date. You said we can't do that. Okay, so it's I said use of semantics, right? The only uh, thing you can yeah, I, I don't I don't think I was saying you should you should meet on the telephone. I'm saying obviously no one ever. Uh, the, uh, I may have said something that is incorrect. Right, which is semantics. But okay, well, the, the, the point is, it's not a relationship. It's building a relationship or discovering if a relationship is possible. That's why, and, and another, and all these things that you all mentioned are all byproducts of this, of this, of this focus, and 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 that's why this is another important point. In our view, if a relationship is not possible, right, then that relationship or that courtship ends, because we don't believe in dating outside of seeking a a, a partner for life. So I think when when you were saying that it's more intellectual. Versus cerebral. I said cerebral. Cerebral. So it's more because dating, like regular dating, is all about emotion. Like it's all about lust and attraction and whether you, you know, have these chemical things. Chemistry. But it, down the line, that doesn't sustain you. You need to exactly. have. Exactly. So, so the, Jewish, the Jewish perspective <laughs> is a little change. bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Methodical, I guess, but but not but not discounting the relationship part. It's just more of okay, you you know you meet this person, you find out are you compatible? If not, okay, nice to meet you. Bye. Adios. Good luck. And now, and that's why you all say that word. It, it has the word God in it. Uh, what? Um, uh, but that's why, like. Um, we don't believe in, in uh, like I said, it's a physical, you know, someone mentioned that. Yeah. You know, you, um, those things are all, those things are all symptoms or uh, signs of a real relationship. We're not trying to have a relationship. We're trying to discover if a real relationship is possible. So yes, oh, and they, that, that's see. part of building a relationship is getting to know the person. But it's not, we don't settle down and make this somewhat of a relationship. So you, you, you don't kiss, you don't touch, you don't... No. What do you do in the case when you have a sibling who says, I can't do that because I can't, you know. Sibling? A daughter. Okay, a daughter. Imagine if I have a daughter, okay. And she says to you, and she says to you that I want to be touchy feely with the guy I I want to date with is Mary. And you're saying, well, you can't do it. Wait, wait, wait. She wants to get married, this hypothetical daughter? This hypothetical daughter will not date an Orthodox person, Jew. 
because she wanna. she wants she does she wants to be more than just meeting. In other words, she wants to no, be able to kiss and touch. And the whole point of that she wants to do that at all. Well, yeah, but how do you combat the? It's that hard to combat of, because because it's 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 God, you're going against society, society right? Um, you're going against society, but the, the only way to do it, and like that's a hypothetical. Else, it's all hypothetical, of course. Um, <laughs> um, it's the only way. The only I didn't say anything. <laughs> the only Don't only you dare way. put that on a recording now. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a hypothetical. <laughs> well, I mean, well, but basically, the point, the point is this: the person, the the daughter, has to the feel, daughter. yeah, hypothetical has daughter. to feel the same way, or it's not going to work. They have to have those same values that uh, they don't have to touch you. But they have okay. to recognize. Were the point you of like this. that, or were you like your like your hypothetical daughter? Uh, I was worse than my hypothetical. Okay, daughter. so then you can't. That's, 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 that's it. You can't. You cannot enforce it. But how is it true that the primary, the primary value or the primary objective of getting married is to have children and have a family? No, I didn't never say that. No, absolutely not. To procreate? That's not it. No, that's follows. So, so what would you no. say? The reason why we get married, we say, is because man is incomplete alone. Low. It's not good for a man to be alone. He has to have a partner to share your life with. This is Genesis chapter 5. Or uh, chapter 3. Apologize. Right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. We take two people and we make him one. It's not about procreation. Procreation is the byproduct of that. Oh, and I have, by the way, if, if you're interested, go to the website. I have I spoke for an hour about this mm-hmm. fascinating class. Uh, find the website at rabbiwobi.com. About Where what? About was about it? marriage. What, was the what name day? Of the, the name of the class is uh, "Till Death Do Us Part." Okay. Colon. Can we still have committed relationships? Uh, I spoke about that for a long, long time. If you want to hear more about it, <laughs> um, what I'll tell you is that no, I don't believe that that's the focus. The focus is to take two people. Who are incomplete as individuals and create a new identity of two uh, of a, a new singular identity, and I pointed out that's that's part of the challenges. It's a whole it's a whole class, and I can speak about it for much longer than I spoke about it. Where is it written that a man who is not does not have a wife is not a man? That's in Yevamus sixty three a. And what does that mean? Twelve lines on the top. Uh, seven lines on the top. What does that mean? <clears throat> That's a very good discussion. I actually spoke about it in Farakwe by my, my sister just recently got married. Yeah, my and I spoke about it uh, by the, the Shabbat party that they had before the wedding. I spoke about that. It doesn't say a woman. Kol Adam, says, Kol Adam she'en lo e Adam. Every man, does, every man that doesn't have a woman is not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discussion because a man's incomplete. You're not, you're not complete. The same as a woman. Exactly. The, we we the whole the whole the whole feminism and 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 the whole idea of women's rights and women it doesn't, it doesn't exist in Judaism because we never view women as inferior. We say there there are two parts of one whole: right hand, left hand. None of them more. The right hand is not going to say, "Oh, you're not giving me enough attention," or "I don't have my state." Right, right. We view the husband and wife as two parts of the same entity. You know, right? the, the men and the women. Become priests and nuns, and they swear never to get married. And they found out about that line in the Talmud, and they were very insulted and said, "How dare you say that our monks and priests well, are not so good Rabbi, what well, about that's the, the, the women? What about not having children? Yeah, well, they were, they they the, isn't it something, something that if a woman doesn't have children, <laughs> the same thing, something with the children that that you have to? That's in Jewish tradition, every woman should have. Well. Well, actually, the first mitzvah in the Torah, pru uruvu umilu saaretz, right? It means to be fruitful, and multiply, and fill. I'm very delicate to that point. And like, like Anna is saying, it's a mitzvah for men. It's a mitzvah for men to have children. Uh, Maimonides does write that a woman who has children, while she has no mitzvah to have a child, to have child, but she's doing chesed by helping her husband do his mitzvah. Oh. So women are not obligated in the mitzvah of Puruvu, 
Uh, and men are, and men have that responsibility. Women don't have the responsibility. So, but they have the ancillary okay. mitzvah, okay. the ancillary mitzvah mm-hmm. of, 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 helping, okay. of helping their husband. Additionally, you have a uh, rabbinic mitzvah. We know that the Torah mitzvah of having children means to have one child, one, one boy and one girl, two children. What if someone has five girls? Mm-hmm. He's supposed to have a boy. What if someone has 20, 22 boys? He's supposed to have a girl. That's according to him. Sometimes it's impossible. So what about if you have two girls and then all of a sudden your grandchild is a son, is a boy? Well, no, you have to have, or a man has to have a boy and a girl. Well, you, I don't have you, you can't, can't you, 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 well, you can, can, you can. Then the Shammai said two boys. Right, but that's not what we go with, correct? So it has to be a boy and a girl? To a boy and a girl. Why? Because that, that's the replacement rate. The father and mother are a boy and a girl. They have to have a boy and a girl. Right? They have to at least leave a boy and a girl. Um, obviously, this is one of those mitzvahs that it's really hard yeah. for someone to, to do that. If someone could have 28 kids, then they could all be... Uh, right, exactly. So, so nobody have your own son. Yeah. Oh, but a woman definitely have... You don't have to choose. Like Rachel had... The, the matric Rachel had this feeling that unless she had a child, might as well just kill me. Or might as well... I don't want to live. Yes. I think women have an inherent... Desire. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Not that's true. Not now. Some yes, some no, but um, <laughs> now women are fighting for their ability to prevent uh, or yeah. to, you know, Murder. now uh, Maybe they just to abort after later. 20. Right. <clears throat> well, you can't it's, have it at 40 or 50. And if anyone wants to hear about abortion, will you buy my abortion class? No, but I was trying to listen to it online and I haven't had enough time to uh, yeah. ask the I would love to have it. Beginning, so I haven't heard it. I spoke about it. I did a Wednesday night class on abortion. You did? Because 20 weeks. I mean, come on. on. It's on on my website, Abortion and Jewish Law. Yeah. It's a great class. What's the address? Abortion, RabbiWalby.com. Same website. Is that one of the hot topics? Yes. Abortion and Jewish Law. You should listen to it. I'm going to. All I did, I didn't say any of my own opinions. I said. In the Jewish Law. You said Jewish Law. Okay. So I need to see it and then. Should I share it with my... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it turns out... Well, it's actually... it's um, it's 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 actually much more liberal than you would expect. Because uh, the... Ju- yeah, Jewish... You know, Judaism was lumped together with... And I didn't present any of my own positions. It was just what the Torah says. Uh, what the halachic opinions are. And it was, I totally uh, did, I didn't filter it in any way uh, you know but you would think that people assume that Judaism gets lumped in with Christianity and life begins at conception and it, it, you kill a two second old uh, you know zygote yeah. it's uh, it's murder and that's not that's not it's not like that in Jewish law yeah about 20 weeks it's already a baby I mean, okay, I don't want to argue about this now. Listen, the listen to the class. Isn't it that when it has taken its own breath that it's really severe? So I would advise you to all... To, uh, <laughs> it's all available on the website. You could listen to the class and we could talk about it. Is it a bunch of neutral cells, nor is it a complete thing. It's something in between. To agree, you're right. It's something in between. Okay, so that's marriage, right? So courtship, we said... All everything you need to know about Jewish courtship, it's all it's all contained in, in these things, and that's we're dating to get married. Dating is the time to discover if a relationship is possible, and that's why when a ba- when it, when it's not you know when it, when it turns out it's not the right person for you, right? You move on to the next person, right? Dating for marriage, and that's why we don't believe in um, a premarital sex because oh this, what? <laughs> that's a nasty word. <laughs> what? No, what? Premarital sex. Oh, I thought you were flinching. You don't believe. No, I mean. <laughs> okay, so you don't. And that's and the, and why? Because that is, um, a, a you know, that's sex is obviously a form of a relationship, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't believe in having relationships while dating. We believe that's a mistake, yeah. Yeah. Right? right? We believe dating is time to discover if relationship is possible. Doesn't it's setting it, down the the foundation for the for the marriage. Doesn't it say that there are three ways to get married? And one is by putting the ring on, and one that is means you want to get married. Here, they don't want to get married. Here, they want to date. Okay, but that wait, isn't wait, a transaction wait, wait, of marriage. Wait, wait. You're right in the transaction I, of marriage. There's two others, and I don't remember the third one. But one of them is by actually having sex. That's 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 a legally binding thing to do. Now you're married. And they say a man who gets married that? that way should be whipped. No, okay. Wow. 
So this. Bart, you oh, get this? You are. We are get Brian and he's taking the up all of a sudden. So the first oh, Mishnah. I don't know okay, you. Let's, let's clearly hear here. The first Mishnah in Hindushin describes how marriage happens. That's one of three ways. Either, like you said, right? Uh, huh? On their finger. Well, or ring, or any form of monetary money or money, money equivalent, or a document, or sex, right? But now it doesn't mean just any kind of sex. It means sex with the intention to get married, with two witnesses, not witnesses that are right there. But it has to be done in the prism of marriage, and that's why that's why like the, the rabbis that's why the rabbis uh, uh, viewed it unfavorably because it's kind of a I don't know. You, it's probably an, it, it's say immodest way to get married when say okay, you guys wait outside and now. You know, I'm going in and... Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why they whipped him, but the, the whip is called Marcus Mar. They didn't actually whip him. It's, it's rabbinic whipping. What it is. Which is what, symbolic? Which means they, 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 they punished him, but to their, use their discretion. I mean, it's not it's not the whipping as in... In, in Torah law, we believe in caning. We don't believe in imprisonment. Caning, right? Just like they do in Singapore. So there's no crime in Singapore. They would just do it in this country. There would be no crime here either, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what, you know, uh, it's, oh, it's not humanitarian. Rather send them to prison for 18 years, right? <laughs> well, that's really nice. Wait a minute, but how many yeah, years would Solomon go to prison <laughs> for? <laughs> Who? Solomon. How many wives did he have? So oh, no, but he got married to them in other ways. That means the point is, well, the point is that. What other ways? How do they get married? We get married today via using a monetary transaction. Like, the man nice. gives the woman <clears throat> a ring. A shekel. Uh, or, or, right? Or a gold piece. All right, whatever. Piece. And, sh- and, and they it's both have intention that this transaction will uh, equal them being married. Okay? Mm-hmm. Quick question. Not, don't take a personal. I'm just trying to say, why, so why rabbis don't wear a ring? Uh, it's... What? Why don't I wear a ring? Why do rabbis not wear I just think that I, I didn't wear one because my dad didn't wear one because his dad didn't wear one. Um, it's it's not really for any reason. Um, but probably because traditionally, you know, or at least historically, yeah, men, didn't, men didn't wear jewelry. Only women yeah. wore jewelry. So it, that became the, um, the, you know, that the de facto tradition. And um, because... But there are plenty of people, plenty of quote-unquote Observant Jews who wear rings, so it's not. Uh, I it has nothing it. to do with. No, so come to Young Israel. You'll see plenty of people wearing. Uh, it has nothing rings. to do with. with no, you not. rapping to filling on this thing. No, 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 no. And even with tefillin, there's no problem of a chatzitza so long as it's past your elbow. So you can wear you can wear a, a wristwatch and put tefillin on top of the wristwatch. It's not a problem, or a ring or whatever. If you but wear but a ring. the ring is what is the thing with which he purchases her. Well, purchase. He is not being purchased, so he doesn't. He doesn't need a ring, right? It's not be a ring either. Be any monetary uh, value, right? Okay. So, so she so, doesn't have to wear a ring either because he doesn't have to wear a, a ring. Silver quarter. Right. He, right. He can give her a, a can of uh, snack, something not that not has value. Something, something that has a well-defined value. Right. Uh, how much the value is? It has to be something significant. It's a pruta, a certain. Denomination of a coin from ancient times. Anyhow, I, we, we just sidetracked. But so that's courtship. Sorry, that's fine. That's fine. No, I appreciate it's, no, that. No, no. Where are we here? Are we married yeah. or are we just courting? Still? We're courting. We got married. Okay. What about? We talked about briefly what right. marriage is. Now, marriage is not just a way to have kids. Right? What is not marriage? Not what it is. Marriage is about two people from two backgrounds, from two identities, from two um, different families becoming. A single identity, developing a single family, a single perspective, uniting, right? Like, like, the, like the verse says, they should become one flesh. So that means, obviously, on a physical level, but also on an emotional level, also on a spiritual level. We view two as being one, right? We know that the, in, in, in the, um, if you take a look, if you actually critically examine the beginning of, the, of Genesis, how, the, uh, how man is actually being formed is... Zachar Baram. When, when the Almighty created a uh, man, he created a man as being a single entity, a man and woman together. Mm-hmm. Human means the human, right? A single entity, male and female. If you take a look at the Talmud in Subis, uh, 8a, it describes 
that originally man was man and woman, was, which was a single entity. They were separated and then they were reunited together. So we view marriage as the man being one half and the, 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 the woman being the other half of a single entity. So that means that anybody who's not married is incomplete. And that's why, like we said, the Gemara says in Ivamis, call Adam, Adam, because if you're not married, you're incomplete. What do you do if you never find that partner? Well, find just, her. Just, Him or her. Just, just pray to the Almighty. How do you find anything? How do you do anything without the Almighty's help? How do you breathe without the Almighty's help? Do you, do you, and when you're to sleep at night, how do you breathe? You're not there to the Almighty. He's making you breathe. How's your blood pumping endlessly? Right, so, it's right. Good. everything we do is is because of the Almighty, help, right? So the Almighty also in this area, and you know what? If we speak to people that have happy marriages, each one of them will say, "Oh, the way I met my wife or my husband, it was some crazy story, right? It was it was just you know we, by chance someone right right or somehow we met, right? Why? Because the Almighty plays a part in this part of our lives as well, helping us find the person that you know that we should settle down and you know have a, share our lives together." Yes, so if a person becomes a widow yeah. and doesn't get married anymore, is that person incomplete or, or if they were? Or, um, what? So if someone becomes a widow, that's mm-hmm. a good question. If someone becomes a widow or a widower, yeah. are they incomplete? Like well, I, I think that there, it's the reason why I say it's a good question because I'm not sure if... Um, let's say someone, you know, two, uh, two, two people got married and they lived together for seven years, and then one of them died first. Mm-hmm. But they're still, they're still, in 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 my view, they're still married to each other. I mean, they're still, mm-hmm. they're still a team. They're still a group. Okay. They're still a single unit. Just one of them is the ground. Exactly. They're still together in paradise. Okay. Right. They're so soul, they're soul, soul is one. Right. But right. right. if they got divorced, then they won't be together. No, in that's paradise. different. So then they're incomplete. This different story. Yes. Rich, Rich has a question. Yes. Rich is a big boy. You can fight for his Yeah, rights. but he doesn't speak up. Yeah, okay, Rich, what you got? I'm just going to interrupt the ladies. <laughs> Smart marriage, guy. there's, and it's my understanding, I, I don't know this, but there are certain stages as far as, like, the betrothal and then marriage. Yes, the good question. Things. Good question. So what we have is called Erusin. Uh, or Kiddushin and Nisuin. These are them okay. giving you the... the, the, the Let's go. Is that's part of the marriage. Yes. What she's three called things? the three things? What are um, the three well, things? one of them has two names and one of them has one name. But what are these? Betrothal is a... Betrothal is a Rusin or Kiddushin. These are the same names. Betrothal. 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 Like engaged. It's a Rusin or Kiddushin. Engaged. Right, to but, be but it's well. It's not quite the way it is today. It's actually they're actually married, but marriage stage one, and then nisu in is marriage stage two. Right, we think of it as betrothal and marriage. Um, in uh, in ancient times, what they used to do is they would have kiddushin or erusin, and um, and a year later they would have nisu in. In today's times, if you go to a Jewish wedding, you'll see that under the chuppah, they go to under a chuppah. And they have the presentation of the rings. Mm-hmm. That's Kiddushin. Right? And then, directly afterwards, they go into a secluded room. That's the Nisuin. So it happens right at the same time. According to some opinions, the Chuppah itself is the Nisuin. So in in our tradition today is that we do it all, all at once. The presentation of the ring is called? It's called Kiddushin. Kiddushin. Yeah. So the one-year period. Right. In between, that was the year where you couldn't go to war. Or right. Excellent. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> what was the intervening period called? Huh? The intervening period. <laughs> um, I don't know. The intermediary period? The between? I don't know if it was a specific name. But it's, I don't but think it was a name for it. You say nowadays, but nowadays it's been for how long? 500 years? It has been for a while. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the hist- like when historically was this shift. Nisuin. Nisuin is either Nisuin. It's either the Chopa itself, according to some opinions, the Chopa itself, or it's the Yichud, which is the seclusion that they have after the Chopa, or it's when they consummate their marriage. Well, the percentage of the Ketubah is nothing? 
No, the Suba is, 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 is no. You think yeah. you guys are gonna be saying that you're gonna go to Brazil? Okay, so, okay. No. I'm confused. You have to okay. have the Suba, before Suba's, you even. Suba. Okay, so yeah. the yeah. presenting exactly. of the ring Suba's, is Kedushim. Yeah. So and when you get the church before you do this, is, is done um, before, before that. Before right. you. Um, okay, I'm sorry. And right, it's right after the or seclusion is right. called because that is the document that guarantees the responsibilities of the nisuin. The account can't consummate the wedding until after we the nisuin. Uh-huh. I signed my ketubah before, before we got we married. Down I, am, I understand you signed it before. It. Is the husband the groom that signs it? Did not sign it. You sign it. I did. But um, Rabbi brought it to my room. Yeah, no, both signed. No. First of all, I know again. Okay. It's a little bit technical, but there are actually two documents. There's something called a Tznaim, mm-hmm. and something called a Tsuba. And because we have the Erosin and the, the, and the Nisuin all done at once, so we have the document for the Erosin, and that is quite complicated. There's actually two documents. Every Jewish one, there's two documents. There's oh. one called a Tznaim, and that is the agreement for the Erosin, right? But because we're doing the Nisuin right afterwards, there's another document called a Tsuba, which is the agreement for the, for the Nisuin. That's why it's complicated. But I don't remember writing it. I don't remember anything that happened when I got married. <laughs> Good or not, tell you. And that was only uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, that was only married. seven years. Yeah, at least years you, ago. you got married. You knew the language. Brad, when we got married, it was in Hebrew and in Spanish, so he didn't know anything. He just said they told him what to say. He, he said, just okay. said he just said I. Yeah, he no, was he so married. Yeah, exactly. Which he had to say like That's three times. <laughs> Yeah, because I got married in Venezuela, so we had two brothers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so that is uh, courtship and marriage. Um, One more question on there. Yeah. Um, I, I know you it's me. fine. It's fine. So, after the betrothal, and I, I realize this is all a bunch of stuff that doesn't happen anymore, but after the betrothal, <laughs> yeah. do, do, how do the rules change? Can you hold hands she now? Is, or? Well, she is... Was in ancient, well, they're married. If he dies, if he die, if he, I'm sorry, if they want to, she wants to go her separate ways, she has to get a guess. Right? She has to get a divorce document. Are they allowed to sleep together? Well, if they sleep together, then they, they just did Nisuin, right? So they could sleep together and they just, that will just usher in the Nisuin. Can they hold hands? Uh, Before they, hold they sleep hands. together? Uh, could they hold hands? That's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know why not. I'm saying they're allowed to sleep together, right? They're sleeping together. They, they could. Yeah, they could. Do, right? they think they could <laughs> yeah, me too. Right, they're married. They're yeah, married. I it's just they're not living together because... Yes, yeah, that there's a reason I'm saying... They don't live together as long as they want. It, it's like the in-between, so they're half married, but they're kind of married, but they're, you know... They have had No. So they had the ceremony. It's the way... The reason why they used to do it in each time like this is mm-hmm. that there's a certain degree of security to know that you have someone, that you're married to them, but now you could, let's say, they got married very young in those days also, right? So if you're like 17 or 16 or 15, mm-hmm. right, you get married, but they give the the bride and groom a year to mature, but they're, but they're married. So they have like that degree of insurance, like the insurance, like the, or the degree of comfort that you know that you have someone that you're married with. Okay. But they just wait for their children to mature, and then they can actually move in together and live together and, and be actually married. <laughs> And that was ain't gonna happen in that right. Day. So then today's yeah. time, so it's, it's, no, it's, and that's why today's time we just do it all once. No, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. hundreds of years have been doing it that way. Because yeah. Huh? What's that the marriage? Huh? <laughs> okay, what's that the marriage? So the doors. Um, <laughs> Stop. no. Uh, so there Stop is, it. Like, they have, and they and they lift apart the for a year, but they can hold hands. Oh, the right. purity of the the purity after marriage is the purity, family purity. Oh, so we could talk about it. it's important to talk about, and this is. Is that part um, of a marriage? Well, I want to talk about divorce because this is really pertinent to divorce. I'll explain to you why. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, okay. So, um. Wait, wait, so, so the purity of the marriage. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll, After, uh, okay, that's fine. So, um, uh, unfortunate. It's an unfortunate reality is that divorce is, uh, happens very common. Uh, it's very unfortunate. It's a very sad thing in, in Judaism. Um, we know that the end of. The tractate that deals with divorce, it's called Tractate Gittin. On the very last page, it says that a couple gets divorced. It's such a sad thing that even the Mizbeach sheds tears. What's a Mizbeach? Mizbeach is an altar, right? It's an actually, it's a physical object that was in the temple. Which means even 
things that don't normally have emotions, even they get uh, emotional about it. It's the saddest, saddest thing, especially if there's children involved. It's terrible. And even today, it's, it's such an economic waste. It's such, it's such a sad thing when people commit their lives to each other and for whatever reason it doesn't work out. Or um, Now, why does divorce happen is a very important point because if you want to avoid it, no one likes divorce. And no one wants to get divorced when they get married and no one wants their children to get married and get divorced. Um, you have to understand why people do get divorced. And um, in my, in my uh, assessment... Uh, there's actually five separate reasons why people get divorced. And you know, I tell my students that you want to make sure that you don't have any of these factors that contribute towards divorce. Now, I'll quickly outline what these factors are. I don't want to get bogged down. And once again, for a third time, I'll send you to the website and you can find the whole class on the website. Okay. Um, and the five factors are that they're not, and they all start with the letter C. Compatibility, communication, commitment, common uh, common life goals, I can't I can't read. and complete emotional and sexual fidelity. Communication, <laughs> compatibility, <laughs> communication, compatibility, commitment, commitment, communication, common life goals, and complete sexual and emotional fidelity. I'll say it one more time, and that's it. Hold on. Yes. Compatibility, commitment, communication, common life goals, and complete sexual and emotional fidelity. Fidelity means faithfulness. Now, um, why do I bring this up? Because it and and because we have to we have to recognize what sexual. contributes to divorce if we want to prevent it. And these five reasons are five core reasons. A lot of people fight about finances. A lot of people fight about a lot of different things. But those things are signs that on an emotional level, they're not committed to each other. That's why they fight over silly things. So when I'm looking for five things that contribute towards marriages succeeding or failing, I'm looking to five real reasons. Not five reasons that are given as excuses for to break up marriages. Rather, real reasons that make or break a marriage. I think also society now, nowadays. Well, what's society? Know, because nowadays everything is so open. You know, they That's even have websites for 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 couples like to to find other couples. Other couples. <laughs> I mean, they, um, yes, you know, and yeah. and you know what? That means there's the lack of commitment. Very good, the lack of commitment. Yeah. Yeah. There are women who flee to shelters because they're true. being physically abused or they are afraid of being physically attacked or maybe even only emotionally and verbally abused. Um, that's because the husband thinks that he's entitled to take out all of his emotional frustrations on his wife and blame her. And then, and he could have all part of these and still feel that really? he's entitled to do that. I think there's a severe so lack of compatibility. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, he likes her. He wants her. Really? No, like compatibility doesn't mean that he likes her. Compatibility means that he has the character and she has the character that go together. Someone like that who who, who who's angry and who you know who, but he who would is be that tempered. With anybody. Okay. So then he okay, then then he's not gonna be compatible with anyone. Very good. Robert, sometimes people, unless he meets someone who can drift, match him. Sometimes people drift away. Sometimes so people do? don't grow okay. together. That is so common life goals. They have to have a life goal that keeps them together. That's the whole. Uh, yeah, but Robert, I mean, they're going towards a destination. You cannot take a lifelong journey if you don't know where you're going to. If you want to share your life with someone, you better make sure that you have a life goal that are aligned with each other. But the goals I'll, change as it goes, as the years okay, go by. So you change together because your identities. Is, so they are both growing, but their growth could change. I promise you. Oh, Some God people interfere. grow more than others. Many, many times to keep. And also, it's that you have commitment. I can promise you. That I, can, I had <laughs> divine intervention on more than one occasion. <laughs> and it's also... <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Very true. And there's Absolutely. also an idea of commitment. Commitment is an attitude of what it means that we're, we're married and we're staying married and we're committed to each other and we're, we're, we're going to make it sure it works. And we're going to deal with the challenges. And this is where society comes in because society has made marriage very much disposable. 
marriage is like a job. You have to work so hard for it. Oh, marriage is a lot harder than a job. <laughs> now, um, why do I say that the laws of family purity are, are important to this discussion? Because the only way to have vibrant sexual uh, fidelity and excitement from, you know, for the couple for years and years and years is if they observe the laws of family purity. And that's why uh, in Israel, there's many, many, many couples, even though they're not observant at all, but they observe the laws of nida, family purity, because it's such a benefit to the couple, to their relationship, that everyone agrees that it, it, it's beneficial for them. Now, um, why do I say that? I, the reason why I say that is because statistics, and I have studies, I've, I, once again, go to the class, you'll hear all the studies, but the studies show with absolute uh, conclusiveness that uh, people lose the um, the thrill and the excitement of their physical relationship very, very, very quickly. Uh, you disagree with that? I, I do, but that's okay. But okay, I but a statistics show, statistics. I understand statistics. But, yeah, I understand. but I read in more than one place... Wait a minute, this is the most interesting no, part, and you no, have to leave? Uh, my wife just texted me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I'll, be all, I'll be on the website. I'll, so. I'll, I'll finish up. It'll be on the website. And statistics are, are absolutely I clear. I think the statistics are clear. Yes. And yeah. it's, it's uh, I have the data, the data that I collected from, um, you know, third-party sources show that the peak, the peak of a, of a couple's physical relationship mm-hmm. is when they get married. It's all downhill from there. And that's the reality. And in Especially when children come. In frequency of how often they sleep together, in excitement, and how they describe their excitement, and that leads, unfortunately, when people are bored, when people are unsatisfied with their physical relationship, mm-hmm. they look elsewhere. Right. And that's these are statistics. So there may be an exception to that rule, but, but overall, we that. see a decline. Rabbi, I've how read do you how several do you sources that that men who observe Nita when their wives are unavailable, they go to prostitutes. <gasps> so and uh, the prostitutes report that they get lots of from men coming to them during night. Now. Uh, Okay, what about the from men who eat pork and Yom Kippur? It's not true. Then. What about the from men that eat pork and Yom Kippur? I don't know about those. I haven't heard anybody report. What do you say? From is the is the Yiddish word for observant. Yeah. Or orthodox. What about from. the orthodox men that eat pork and Yom Kippur? Huh? Nobody. What about them? I don't know. No, no, no. They're not orthodox. <laughs> so just because someone has a beard and pace doesn't mean that if you frequent prostitutes, he's not observant. But there's a lot of them. Okay, oh, a lot of them. I don't know. Remember? So what? People have challenges, and, and, and we have responsibilities. And if someone if someone says, I'm eating pork and I'm well, I'm sorry. There's something, you're not following the laws. And if someone frequents prostitutes, hey, hey, you ain't following the laws. There's no I'm justification. Yeah. Yes, there's no justification for that. What about someone who cheats in business? Huh? And, you see, uh, you know, every like eight years, there's another Jewish guy who goes to prison who's actually observant. Huh? Oh, what happened? You're supposed to be morally upstanding, right? right? Well, first of all, the reason why they get plastered on the front cover, but not when an African American uh, shoots someone and kills someone in Chicago, that's not a story because that happens all the time, right? I'm not trying to be biased. I'm saying statistics show that yeah. 94% of all murders in America are black people killing black people. Yeah. Right, it's just very unfortunate, but that's a reality. It's not a story, right? When a Jewish guy goes to prison for embezzling money or for tax evasion, mm-hmm. that's a story, right? Because and you know what? If law. someone is dishonest, yeah. they're not following the rules. They're the Orthodox Jew, quote unquote, who eats pork and kipper, right? So, Rabbi, so yes, you? and and there's no justification for misdeeds like that. Absolutely not. How do you how do you balance spirituality and physicality? Why why does that have to be a balance? Balance what? Spirituality. Okay, it's a great question. Like, Marco, it's a great great question. I, I like the but, question, but I couldn't hear what you said. How do you balance spirituality and, and physicality? And, physicality? Um, and do you mean specifically what? Sexual, like the sexuality, like is like, like spiritual, which is within the soul. And physicality with sex. How do you? How do you balance? It's, how do you? Do, it's, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, but, but I think what answer is that we 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 don't. We sex don't, is spiritual. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Sex, sex is spiritual. spiritual? That's, that's physical. Why is it physical? Because it's, it's a physical. It's, it's a human humanly need. So it's what? a humanly. So it's what? not a. 
So what? In fact, we say that the, the highest level someone can reach spiritually is 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 through connecting to his wife, his or her wife, his wife or her husband, right? To look at each other on a deep physical a physical way. And that 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 fire and passion, the fire and passion is compared to the fire the fire that was on them in the temple. Absolutely, it's a big There's mitzvah no, to have it's sex a huge, with your husband on Friday night. It's it, well, it's a mitzvah on Friday night. I'm telling you, I don't know this woman. <laughs> she surprised me tonight. <laughs> what about her? Just that you're sexually aware. <laughs> well, <laughs> because oh, absolutely, okay. it's, it's a huge mitzvah. Okay, we don't view it as as a bad thing. That's the That's Christians. A Christian thing. We view it as very, very, very positively. And it's it's a and tremendous the loss of purity in, in right increase right that, in in, in the, right uh, sex in marriage sex under the proper circumstances is a huge huge mitzvah huge. Well, it makes you closer to the. Uh, it's a mitzvah closer to the Almighty. Why is it closer to the Almighty? Because that's because what the Almighty tells you to do. Into, it tells you this that this is, is a positive thing, very is, very positive thing. There's 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 Hashem of the Shavina. And if you make love to your husband on Friday night, aren't you helping Hashem to be? Well, you don't. You're never helping Hashem. Hashem doesn't need any your help. That's just the point, number one. <laughs> I cannot say that. The body doesn't need anything from us. But no. That's but good. what the Talmud says is the Talmud. This is okay. Clear. Okay. Talmud that says when a zachu uh, shechina be name. There's a shechina. If if the couple was righteous, was meritorious, there's a shechina between them. Where is this shechina? The shechina is specifically when they're sleeping with each other. This is what you just said. When is the Shechem in It's when they're sleeping together. That's when they reach the spiritual heights. Right? And otherwise, otherwise, if you take a look at the at the names of uh, um, of, of Ish and Isha, I'm sure, I'm sure it's oh, heard fire. that. Ish and Isha, they both have the word Ish, which means fire, which is the fire of passion. But you put the Yud by the man, and you put the He yeah. by the woman, and that's the name of God. It and then the passion... When it's done, the man and the woman together, right? That passion has it, it has God has, has uh, God participates in it. Right? Participates, but God, but it's a very spiritual idea. Very, very spiritual. Okay, I need to remember Martin, that. You, I'm gonna give you a book about this. Please. What's the name of the book? Uh, it's from and is it, is it, is it on the website too? Uh, no, this is this is this. Uh, Will you? I'm gonna give you a book about this. Yes. Yeah. Um, Why are you not telling us the name of the book? Because uh, I uh, we'll talk. <laughs> Hold me up. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, that's marriage, and like I said, yeah, it must we don't. Be very not a book. <laughs> no, it's uh, okay. What about? Uh, do we still have more time? Can we finish this? I want to talk about parenting. I want to talk about death. I want to talk about burial and mourning. How is that? It's nine oh five. I How could I could go. I just I will I do. I just got my snapple, so I'm okay. Okay. Should everyone handle that? Otherwise, I won't be offended if anyone leaves, and I'll just speak to them and put it on the website if anyone wants to listen to. It. <laughs> I'll stay. Okay. What about parenting? That's another stage in life. That's. Ooh, that's. I think that's one of the hardest. Oh yeah. Oh my god. And uh, the idea of parenting, I know, there's a great illustration that my grandma, my grandfather wrote a book called Zria Ubinyan Bechinuch, which means planting and building in parenting, and he describes parenting. As half planting, half building. There's two ways to create things. Either via an organic process, planting, right? You plant a seed in the ground, you cultivate it, and eventually it grows, and it grows on its own. Mm-hmm. As opposed to when you build something, you build it, right? Mm-hmm. You every 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 layer, every brick has to be laid by you. Mm-hmm. And he describes parenting as being the balance of these two things. On, on one hand, you have to present ideas, you have to plant them, and they grow on their own over many, many, many years. You plant an idea in a, in a child's head, it stays there, and it percolates, and it grows, and it sprouts, and it develops, right? Planting, but also you have to put rules, you have to build things, you have to, see, you have to, you have to teach things lessons, you have, to, you, have to, you have to, you know, set things in stone, things that don't develop on their own, but you just, you, you know, as a parent, as a pedagogue, your job is to instill these ideas into your child and to, to build a child as well. Um, that, that book actually was the only one of my grandfather's books that was translated into English. And th- this idea is a tremendous idea if you just think about it. Planting and building. And our job in chil- you know, with our children is, 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 is to 
on one hand, to be a planter, right? To, to, to put ideas and let, let it cultivate, let it develop on its own. Is there an organic process? But also, also to build, you know, to build, which means to actively, you know, present ideas and promote ideas uh, that the child will, 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 will you use to shape who the child's going to be. Another illustration um, that my grandfather gave is the idea of a candle, right? Who's the candle? It's the parents, right? One candle lights another candle. How does the candle light the other candle? Right? We have our view on life, our view on spirituality, our view on what's really important. That's our candle. We put it there, and we, we transfer it to the child, and the child is now their own candle. And the child is able to pass that on as many times as, as, as you know, they are... They are their own vibrant entity. It's the idea of us being able to confer on our children everything that is. It means this. This is um, regardless of if it's it's in areas of practice, in areas of character, in areas of patience, in areas of, of observance of mitzvahs, and in, in areas of, of life. Everything in life: how to be a good person, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to be um, responsible, um, how to how to how to deal with challenges. You know, it, it's everything. You want, you want it. Your job is to mold your child, to mold your child into who you want them to be. You want them to be as, as you know the best the best that they could possibly be. You're 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 responsible. You're in charge of, of making that of that a reality. That is really lucky. You're really lucky that you get to come out okay. So Either lucky or you're talented. <laughs> I can't take credit. My child is a better person than I am. Okay, but there's also the idea of prayer. Prayer is enormously important for, for a child. I pray. You know, pray for your child <laughs> that they don't get messed up. Pray for your child that no one hurts them. Pray for your child that they have good influences in school and good influences in friends. And yeah. right, it's it's yeah. so important. You care for your children so much. Just I know I speak to the Almighty every day, okay. every single day to watch over my kids. Yeah, my are you going to continue to do that after your children are grown and married? Well, maybe. Of course you have you know, to. Like oh, My son got a motorcycle, and my prayer was that those people around him were to be away from him, to keep him safe and not harm him when he's riding his motorcycle. It's mm-hmm. scary for me, but I keep praying that I've got a bubble on him, and God's going to protect him, and it'll be okay. That's good. You know, it's it's funny. But I also think that in today's, in today's, I'll get to your point in a second, in today's day and age, like, you send your kids to school. Who knows what goes on in these schools? Who knows who goes with these teachers? Who, the world is full of crazy people, like crazy sick people. Lots of sick people in the world. People taking drugs and offering. Forget about drugs. I'm like worried about kids being molested. It happens every day. It's t- it's t- you know just 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 recently. I just heard this on the radio. Literally on the way here, there was this uh, British something. Some guy was a coach on one on, one, on some team or some something. Who was like uh, knighted? He was like a like a, a sir. Some I just heard it on the radio right now. I was listening to the sports station here, and it said that this guy, like after he died, like more than four hundred and fifty kids, boys and girls, came forth that they were abused by him, sexually abused by him. Four hundred. That, that's not exa- the guy said. This is not an exaggeration. Like, could you imagine this? Like the guy put send us. He made send us look, 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 look like a you know. It's that choir boy. Um, now, so that that thing that thing's terrifying as a parent, yeah. and and you and and you have to pray. There's nothing you can do about it besides for prayer. And that also is part of, of what it means to be to be a Jewish parent. So, Rabbi, like I pray, I pray more than once a day. But is praying to God to provide an angel for? my kids to guide them to the right place is that a good prayer absolutely I mean, is there such an absolutely. angel per, per, okay. absolutely angel angel what we view angels is not really what they are all they are is spiritual uh spiritual powers it's not a thing it's a spiritual power there's all there's all thing besides for god that but right to guide them exactly to, okay. you want you say listen i want my child to be be pure, to be to be smart, to be healthy, to be mm-hmm. normal, right? To have direction in life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you pray for that. Absolutely, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. 
So we're talking about today the sprouting and all that, and I use that word today. I said, Brad, the seeds that I planted have sprouted. Uh-huh. Meaning that... Today, and, you know, but the point is like this. You'll plant the seed and you won't see anything for months and years. You won't see the results. Because yeah. you plant it deep, 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 deep in the heart of a child and it gets cultivated and it gets... Right? And eventually, years later, you see the effect. You don't see it. You don't... No, so that's so that's not that's not a no. seed that you planted. That that's building. But there are different kind of seeds. For instance, the one that I just mentioned was because all of a sudden my <coughs> daughters start painting every day. She's she's been painting. My other daughters start doing another art. I'm you know I'm very artsy and I've been trying to plant that into them. And now I'm doing this. I'm doing, and all of a sudden both of them they show me these art projects. I go, my seeds have sprouted. So I'm you know. Because you, you plant little seeds, and I, I'm like, but I used the same word that you used today. I mm-hmm. used it earlier. So, anyway. What about death, burial, and mourning? So, um, we got to that already. Yeah, I'm trying to be a, be a little bit. Uh, so nice. Huh? What? Did we skip one? What did we skip? I don't know. Gray appearance? Or you know, Midlife crisis. <laughs> okay. Crisis. Okay. Death. What else? Death. Death, burial, and mourning. I want to once again. I want to send you for the fifth time to my website. When I spoke about what happens after you die, you were there. Uh, yeah. I spoke in great detail and everything what? from the philosophical to the emotional to the you know just what perspective Jewish perspective on death and and you know uh, Judaism presents for us a, a complete picture about life and including about death and there's a way to die like a Jew and um, and just the, you know what it means to die and what happens after you die I don't want to get into great detail about this because like I say you look at you go to the go to the class and hear the whole thing and what's it again? all on rab- rabbiwobi.com it's all That's the same it, place yeah. it's titled what happens after you die I always hear that Jews and not other people at the moment of death turn their face to the wall I don't know about that, about that. Uh-huh. You never heard the group turn their face to the wall? Before? I don't know about that. Uh, uh, but we have, uh, I'm sure everyone here has heard about the Vidui. Mm-hmm. Vidui is uh, the confession. Uh, traditionally, before a Jewish person is about to die, they have a confession. Vidui? They try to have a have a last last second, uh, you know, it's a like cramming before a test. But you kind of, it's your last second and sec- seconds on earth. You try to, you know, repent for the mistakes that you did over your life. And invariably, people make mistakes. And so, a way to try to you know atone. We know in in our belief is that a person could be a rush or could be a wicked person their whole life, and if on the last day they turn it around, they're not viewed. Tshuva, repentance, has a way to clear away all the mistakes a person did. So, someone could be living their whole life in one direction, mm-hmm. and then at the last second turn it all around and repent and have a real sincere repent, you know, repentance, and like that, it's like they never made those mistakes. That's, that's why it's important, Before, to know that gonna die, and that's right? why you should. Yeah. The, the 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 Mishnah in Pratya Vot, the chapter in Ethics of the Fathers, tells us, repent the day the day that you die, and the idea is but that what about if you die before you die, right? I mean, how do you know if you die unconscious or something? So you don't so know. You know. So every day you're <laughs> repenting. <laughs> that's the that's that, that's the idea, and and uh, what happens to you while you die? What happens to you before you die? What happens to you after you die? is all discussed in great detail. But yes, there's a Jewish way to die as well. And also important for this is we know that uh, in Judaism it's very important to be buried, to not be cremated. It's a very big mitzvah. And I think if your people have the ability to influence others uh, to be buried and not cremated, it's very positive. We don't believe in autopsies, right? There's sanctity to the dead, to the dead, to the cadaver. This, this brings me to a wall? question. Okay, yeah. sorry. A law of the land says you have Where is that the law of the land? Well, I don't know. It seems like if you were murdered, no, and no, you don't have to. No, 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 no. If you're murdered, then yeah. yeah. Actually, in the '60s, <coughs> there was a huge thing in Israel, huge controversy. If you read up about it, uh, that um, that for almost any reason they would uh, they would have give autopsies. And also in the, in the '60s, there was a little bit of a dark dark period in Israel's history that they would they would harvest organs. So I know that my dad, when he was like a teenager, he would 
he would like. He was like on these squads that would, they would they would they had dead bodies, and they were in these morgues. And you know it's against Jewish law to do an autopsy or for sure to harvest organs or whatever. So he, they would like go sneak in, grab the body, and run out and bury the body. Mm. Pretty crazy <laughs> stuff, huh? But I'm saying well, nowadays. Well, organ donation, it's a, that's a whole other topic, and I don't know for sure if it's against Jewish law, but in all likelihood it is. The problem with organ donation is not, is not donating the organ, especially if it's going to save someone's life, that, that would justify donating the organ. The problem with uh, organ donation is that in order to be halakhically dead, in most cases, the organ has to stop functioning. Right. So, and, and so that way... Right. So if, if if the brain ceases to work, then the heart the, the the organs are worthless. So sometimes the brain is still working, the man the person is still alive and they're taking away organs out of a live person. That's the real fear. Wow. And that's murder. So we don't want to encourage murder. Uh, and also it's important, I'll get to you in a second, Rich, is the idea of Triasamesa. We believe that after you die it's only temporary. We believe uh, this is one of the important uh, beliefs that every Jew has to have, and that's the idea that we're, there's going to be a resuscitation of the dead. People that are dead are going to once again have a neshama, have a soul that's going to be reunited in the body. And uh, and death, we view death as being as being temporary. Now, as a great story on this, and I'll, 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 Rachel, I hear what you have to say. Go. No, you, just, you gave me a second question now. Okay, so to ask so, them both. Okay, well, the first one was... Um, Halakhically, it's okay to donate, for example, a kidney while you're yes. still living. Yes, correct. Um, Why can't that same kidney be taken while you're dead? Oh, uh, you're saying one kidney, one kidney, right? Yes. Oh, okay, so you, you're saying that you'll be allowed, to, allowed to, to donate one kidney when you're dead, maybe. Wait, 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 what? So that's a good argument. But then when you were... But the problem is that they, they take one kidney, the other kidney, take the heart, take the liver. They're just killing the guy, and you know that's murder. Right, right. And to us, it's a murder of a ninety-eight-year-old person who's on life support, and murder of a fifteen-year-old boy is the same thing. There's no difference. If the man's alive and you're killing him, it's murder. So, my next question is: You said that when you know when Mashiach comes and we're all resurrected and our neshamas. It's not clear if, if if Mashiach and resurrection are the, are the same thing. It's not clear. When, when resurrection happens, happens, yes. And our neshamas <clears throat> rejoin with our body, it's my understanding that if we don't do enough mitzvah the first time around, we get other chances. So which body is it? That's a very good question. And I'll tell you, at the end of the class when I spoke about what happens after you die, that Wendy attended, um, I said four answers to that question. So it's either the first body, that's the original body, or it's the last body. That's what we talking about. If if there's reincarnation, so which body? That's right. Or it's a composite, right? Or it's a composite of all the different bodies. Can we or... pick our body? <laughs> <laughs> which one would you pick? Huh? This one. Well, that's what. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> five hundred years ago, that body said there was this one. <laughs> but wait a minute. So yes, the fourth one would be that you know. That it's a silly question. Why? Because because we view the body as clothing to the soul. Does it matter? Are you are you wearing your tuxedo that you wore for your brother's wedding, or you're wearing what you wore to the beach? Does that really matter? That's not a question you would ask, right? Would you ask the question? Well, what are you going to be wearing? Are you going to be wearing the tuxedo that you that you wore to your brother's wedding, or what you wear to the beach? It's not a question you would ask, right? Because who cares what you're what you're wearing? Right. The, the fourth answer would be is that, hey, the, the, the body is no more than clothing to the soul. It's not so important which body you wear. Yeah. You just that's want the argument. to be a healthy one. You don't want one that Yeah. That's another question people body. ask. What about spouses? There's lots of questions that are unanswered. Yeah. And, and even if you had a sickness at the time that's, 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 that's occurred, you would still be restored to... I, I I believe yes, but I, I don't know that for sure. But I would I would believe that to be the to be the case. And also, according to or something, isn't it that we are the reincarnation of the first Jews that stood at Mount Sinai? And so reincarnation, as I spoke as I spoke in the class, reincarnation <laughs> is something which is not universally accepted. Uh, even though it's 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 basically the mainstream has accepted it. Um, okay, but, um, but our I, souls. Wait, how do you know? How would anyone know which soul they are? That's beyond me. To, how would someone possibly know that to say that? 
Because Talbot doesn't say anything about reincarnation. What, can we not say that every one of us was there at Sinai? I, I don't know. Can we say that? Who said that? Well, if there's that's an infinite amount of souls, yeah, that, then that, that, yeah. maybe we will. Uh, I don't believe there is an infinite amount of souls. I'll tell you to look at the Talmud of Yavama 62a. So and it's a somewhere finite else. amount of souls. It references a finite amount of souls. So it references this box. 62a? 62a talks about this box uh-huh. that has all the souls. And <laughs> the Almighty is waiting to finish all the souls. How many it's, souls? How many Jew souls are there? I don't know. Jew souls. All these are good questions. But the <laughs> idea the idea of death and what death means, I would say, talk about it. There's there's a lot to talk about. But there's a way to die as a Jew. We have the idea of vidui. We have the idea of separation of soul and body. It's only temporary. And I wanted to end off with a story, a great story from Rabbi Akiva Eger. Rabbi Akiva Eger was, a, was one of the um, great, great, brilliant um minds of the past 500 years. Brilliant beyond description. And he was a rabbi in a city called Posen. Uh, I think it's in Germany. And uh, there was this uh, miser. Miser, someone who's very um, very stingy, very very wealthy guy, but didn't give any tzedakah. So when the person died, they said, oh, we're not buried, we're not putting him in our cemetery. Right? Unless you pay an exorbitant amount of money. So everyone, everyone for the average guy to get into the cemetery, it costs a thousand dollars. And they said to him, uh, said to his kids, oh, you, you, you want to bury him? Bury him some, in somewhere else. In our cemetery, a million dollars. So they, they didn't know what to do, right? The family of this person. So they went to the courts. They went to the official, the mayor of the city. And say it's not fair. We're being discriminated against just because my, my just because our dad was a was a, someone who didn't give stakra, didn't give uh, charity. Uh, but why should he be discriminated? If, if, if the price of a grave is $1,000, you can't charge more to you know, someone else and charge him a million dollars, right? So they went to the rabbi and said, hey, how do you charge him more? So the rabbi said to him, he says, in our, in our faith, in our faith, we say that someone is being buried, it's only temporary. Why? Because the body is going to live again, right? And it's be re- re- It's only temporary. Mm-hmm. But only someone who is generous or someone who does mitzvahs, only they get resuscitated. So this guy who died, it's not a temporary burial, it's a permanent burial. Because he ain't coming back. So therefore it's more expensive. <laughs> yeah, but the, the idea is, is that is also something that we merit. Something that we merit. And that's why it's important for us today, when we're still alive, to you know to live in a way that would that would you know, grant us the ability to be resuscitated. Um, with, you know, with everyone else. So that concludes the life cycles. And I, once again, I apologize for saying this a thousand times. For a more detailed www.rabbiwalby.com What happens t- when you die? And tell your friends. And click like. So go to your Facebook account. Next Tuesday is Tisha B'Av, So no class next Tuesday.